so what is Neigong as opposed to Qigong? No, right? Yeah, I suppose that's quite a sensible question. It's not that defined that well, is it? Neigong is uh, essentially a, a process, a step-by-step -step process that you move through uh, to transform the body. Some people don't like that. They don't like linear. It's like linear becomes a kind of enemy, doesn't it? You know, circular is better, linear is bad, especially within the alternative arts. There's like an idea you shouldn't be goal-based um, in what you're doing. Uh, I don't think that's true, really. I think what happens is certain traditions tend to be a bit more linear, step-by-step, step. A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. Other traditions um, tend to be very much, well, they don't have that linear focus. Instead, they just uh, sit in silence and everything will unfold of its own accord and you know, there's instant realization possible and all these kind of things. And um, I think actually, in my experience of teaching a lot of people over a long time, some people are goal-based and some people aren't. It really is that simple. If you're someone who has a tendency towards being goal-based, you're better off in a goal-based system um, because it will lead you step-by-step step in a linear line. If you're someone who isn't goal-based, you not uh, you don't think in that linear fashion of I need to understand what step comes after what step, then you're better off in the other systems, in the more circular, non-linear-based systems. It, it really is that um, uh, simple, you know. There's almost like a, a thing where those people who aren't goal-based don't like linear practice. They look down on the others and go, oh, that's not the spiritual way and blah, 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 which really isn't the truth. It's just different people have different tendencies. Neigong is definitely a system like most of Taoism, really, that appeals to a linear type people, step-by-step, process-based people. I mean, to walk towards Tao is to walk along a path, right? I mean, a path is a linear play, you know, line from point A to point B. I mean, that implies it's a somewhat linear um, tradition. And yet, conversely, in the end, the path that can be walked is not the real path. So at some stage, <laughs> that linear path has to be stepped off, but the path is still there. Um, in the early stages of your training. And Neigong is that path, okay? Um, or one, at one path, uh, one version of that path, you know. It's a series of changes that the body will go through uh, in your training. So you can practice Qigong alone. Qigong doesn't necessarily have to have a process base in it. Maybe you learn the Baduan Jin, okay? The eight pieces of brocade or whatever. And you practice them every day for the sake of practicing the Baduan Jin. Um, if you do that, then that's okay, that's no problem, there's nothing wrong with that, it'll be good for your health, relax you, build whatever qualities that exercise set is designed to build. It's not one I practice, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's not Neigong, you're not, you're not focused on that uh, process. Rather with Neigong, what, somebody who's practicing Neigong will say, okay, well the next part of my process is I need to open the channels, or I need to fill the Dantian, or I need to whatever, you know, and so what they'll have is, a goal. So I am opening the channels. So they then have a series of exercises called Qigong that are used until the channel system is open. Then once that's done, what's the next stage? And generally what happens is some of those Qigong exercises you did at this stage are no longer useful anymore. You have to progress on to the next set of exercises. And that's, that's how Neigong works. So it's the process inherent uh, within these arts that Qigong exercises are used as a tool to move along. Confusion is added to this because sometimes you'll actually get exercise systems called Neigong, don't you? They say this is the Neigong system or something, or this is the Neigong method. Um, even though they look like uh, Qigong exercises, generally you find they're very systematically linear-based progression systems. So they, they still, anytime you see Neigong, it still tends to follow that route of A needs achieving, then B, then C, then D. That's the Neigong process. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with practicing Qigong uh, alone without an attempt to move a, through the Neigong process. That's okay, it's fine. Um, some people like to do Qigong for the sake of uh, Qigong, but other people want to know where they're going, and that's where uh, Neigong comes in useful. It's like a road map, so you can see where you are and how you're doing in your practice and where you're going next. Can I lift weights and practice the internal arts? Okay, yeah, um, weights, I'm assuming, like bodybuilding and going to the gym, essentially uh, resistance training. Um, I get asked that quite a lot. Um, that's quite a common question. I think probably, um, I mean, it's always been said, it's always been said within arts like Tai Chi that um, it was an internal method that replaced uh, external training. I remember even being a teenager and I've been and first encountering Tai Chi, sort of 14 or, or something like that was, I, I think. And I, I read, I can't remember what book it was. It was a sort of very, a book everybody's got on Tai Chi. Everyone will know it. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. And, you read, and I read it and it said that Tai Chi was a, an art that didn't use weights, didn't use anything like it. It was an attempt to train the body in a different way. And I remember not understanding it, thinking, well, how do you get strong? 
uh, without weights or something like that. And, I th and gradually over time I've come to realize there, <laughs> there are methods, um, over the years I came to understand that there are methods for building strength in the internal arts in Tai Chi and they don't use weights. Um, and I think a lot of people are going through that same confusion, especially now, as, as more information is available on the internet. Uh, and a lot, a lot of the good Tai Chi players, the top ones, are saying you shouldn't lift weights and things. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's why this question is getting asked. I get asked it quite a, quite a few times. I would say the answer is, can I lift weights and practice Tai Chi? It really comes down to your goals. Why are you lifting weights? Okay, reason one. Do you want to be more attractive to the opposite sex? Is it about being more shaggable? If it is, lift weights, because <laughs> Tai Chi will not give you the body <laughs> that you are after, um, just as you can see. <laughs> it's not going to turn you into a Greek Adonis. If your sole aim in life is to be more attractive to the opposite sex, lift weights, for fuck's sake. Lift weights, get big, take loads of protein, get massive, whatever you need to do, and then maybe that'll give you a go. If you're lifting weights um, to get strong alongside your internal arts practice, then you don't really need to lift weights. Um, because if you're, take Tai Chi as an example, if your Tai Chi method is correct, okay, which um, is a harder thing to come across than you might think, and uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of point, there's a lot of places in the Tai Chi system where you can kind of make an error and then it's useless. Unfortunately, it's, there's lots of pitfalls. You have to find someone who really knows the method. But if say you have the correct um, method for building internal force, um, essentially through standing in, in Tai Chi practice, then you will not need to lift weights. Um, you'll get strong enough. Okay? You won't necessarily build a lot of sort of contractive mass like a bodybuilder will, but you'll certainly be strong. Um, my body doesn't carry a, a lot of uh, mass to it, as you can see, but it's certainly, it's certainly strong when I'm uh, using my body in, in Tai Chi and things. The, the body builds um, power according to the um, Yijin Jing, essentially. A lot of Tai Chi people don't know that the Yijin Jing, the, the Sinu Changing Classic, is actually the instructions for how their system works, because most people associate the Sinu Changing Classics with Shaolin and Shaolin styles. Um, but in actual fact, it was a, a series of principles that was absorbed into all of the martial arts and into Qigong and into Neigong and influenced a lot of what they did. The Yijin Jing was, was the underline of everything. The Yijin Jing dictates the sinew changing classic, rather, I should call it in this English name, um, dictates that there's two ways to build a body. One is from the outside in, and one is from the inside out. The outside in um, is essentially based on resistance. You stress the muscles to make them grow, as most bodybuilders or whatever would be familiar with. That's the external way of building the body. Sinew changing classic then said that there was an internal way to build the body, which is based on cultivating the qi. Okay, and in this term, it's using the tai chi definition of qi, not the qigong definition of qi, um, using the qi to convert the huang, often translated as the membranes, but in actual fact not true, um, it's the soft connected tissue of the body. Um, this then causes the sinews to change, uh, which are the connective tissues closer to the surface of the body. It's through these connective tissues that most of the jin travels in tai chi, and these will then cause the tendons to grow. So, Qi affects the soft tissues, which affects the sinew channels, which affects the tendons in that sequence. So your body will strengthen from the inside out. The muscles are not mentioned. Um, as in, you still have to use some muscle. You, muscles are a part of how the body functions and stabilizes itself. But um, they don't build their strength by building mass or compressing the muscles. Rather, they let the soft tissues push into the sinews, which then push into the tendons, um, meaning the connecting points into the, into the bones. Yeah. So the strength builds, but the strength builds from underneath. The muscles were considered more on the surface. This power builds from underneath. In, there's lots of um, details as to how that's done, and generally you, you need to engage in uh, authentic internal training to experience that. Um, but if the muscles are contracted habitually, they get in the way, then they stop this process from taking place. It's like the inside can only be accessed if the outside is relaxed. If the outside is tense, you cannot get to the inside, right? And resistance training, whatever you're doing, builds a lot of habitual tension into the muscles. Um, and when that habitual tension is there, then you cannot access the inside of the body. So that's why they said, um, don't practice weightlifting while you're doing Tai Chi. So, as I said before, I like to argue with myself. If you don't have an authentic um, standing system that builds this sort of a pressure-based force from the inside of the body, 
you're probably best off lifting weights, <laughs> to be honest, um, because bad Tai Chi uh, or bad standing or bad Qigong might relax you, but it will also weaken you. Uh, it won't build strength, so you're probably best off lifting weights. But you should also understand that you are now practicing a hybrid and it's not really right. If you can find an authentic internal system that builds your body in the right way, you will build more than enough strength without the use of weights. Okay, you do not need them um, in any way, shape, or form. You know. Okay, is it possible to become sick from qigong practice? <laughs> that sounds like a question from a, a worried person. <laughs> yes, I don't. That's probably not going to alleviate your fears, is it? Never mind. I should have sugarcoated it. Yeah, it is possible to get sick from qigong training. Um, interestingly, if, you, if someone, there's two, two real types of qigong, there's, there's authentic qigong and then there's breathing exercises where you're waving your arms around. The breathing exercises where you wave your arms around um, isn't probably going to do you much harm, um, but some of the more deep uh, internal aspects of qigong can cause you problems, especially if you either have blockages in the system, um, meaning areas that qi can't conduct through properly, um, or the microcosmic orbit's not in place, or you're building too much compression, too strong and intense. I mean, there's lots of reasons why. Most of the time, it comes from frying the nervous system and sending too much chi up. It is possible to get sick, yeah. You have a, there's a series of illnesses in Qigong. They've got rather fantastical names. There's dragon sickness, most people will know, uh, know of, will have heard of. Um, there's Qigong deviations, which essentially is a reversal of chi within one of the channels, meaning it functions in the wrong way. There's a marvelous one called entering fire, uh, walking fire entering demons, um, which essentially is frying your body to such an extent that it exacerbates your psychological hang-ups, your demons that walk in our internal demons. Um, there's poison fire effect in the heart. This happens to a lot of practitioners who practice a lot of uh, sexual um, practices that actually create sexual deviance. So your there's a mechanism behind it. Doesn't matter right now, but your desires and your romantic connections kind of get intertwined, they get mixed up. Um, so uh, sort of sexual obsession starts to develop and a lot of sexual deviance and it can even manifest as, I mean I've known people who practice this who find they start to become very um, sexually dominant and even uh, paedophilia. I mean the, the, it sounds extreme, I know, but uh, there are Qigong people that will taint their heart to such an extent um, that that sheer innocence starts to become sexually attractive. It's a massive deviant. But if you scratch beneath the surface in the Qigong community, it happens a lot. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of Qigong uh, masters, I use the term in inverted commas, if, if they develop this error, I wouldn't call them a master, I'd call them a bit of an idiot, really, but um, that develops to such an extent that sort of sexual dominance and sexual deviance becomes a uh, a sort of demon that they have to have to deal with. That's why the methods based on Jing, the sexual practice, were considered a very dangerous path. They were the fire path, very, very tricky to, to walk safely. Um, so I've made all that sound rather scary, really, haven't I? I it is, yeah, it is possible. I mean, that being said, most people who do Qigong won't get ill, um, but people do. And I, I see quite a, a lot of it, <laughs> not from within my own school, I might add. I'm very safe. Um, but from within other schools, I get people come to me um, because somewhere on the line I got a name of someone who treats Qigong sickness. I don't know how, where that came from. But people come to me in my acupuncture clinic for help. So I do see a lot of people with uh, sickness from yoga, Qigong, meditation, things like that. Normally it's because they had poor instruction. When they actually tell me what they were told to do, I'm like, oh God. And often they have um, symptoms arising, like you know, sharp stabbing headaches and mood swings and things. And the teachers have told them, don't worry, it's just a clearing process, you'll pass through it. It's not a clearing process, it's an error starting to manifest, okay? Clearing processes in Qigong should be a, I don't know, temporary minor feeling of nausea or something like that that doesn't last very long. But if you're getting like <laughs> shooting stabbing pains into the middle of your brain or your heart and the mood swings going up and down, there's a problem, okay? That is a symptom that if you carry on will start to turn into a Qigong deviation or, or a Qigong um, sickness. I mean. Internal training will have a sort of air of risk to it because you are going onto the inside of your body essentially to like the blueprints and tinkering around with them to create certain reactions. It's like going into the back end of a computer and changing all the code. You know, if I went into this computer and changed all the code, God knows what it would do. I've got no knowledge about computers. And the same can happen with your body if you go into the back end and tinker around with Qigong, which is why you need an authentic system and a teacher who knows what they're doing. 
it's also interesting to me that um, here's, a, here's a bridge between Qigong and Chinese medicine. It is my opinion that if you teach the basics of Qigong, you know, you're teaching some exercises or the basics in Egong or whatever, you're teaching the early stages of, uh, then fine, no problem. If you're going to go deeper, okay, you are, you are going to take people beyond the early stages, you need to understand Chinese medicine. <laughs> that is a part of your responsibility. You don't you just need to understand it. You need to be a practitioner of Chinese medicine. You need to have clinical experience because otherwise you're playing with fire. You can't take people past the basics um, with no potential to either diagnose or help understand what's taking place. And Western medicine knowledge is not enough, Western medicine knowledge, because most of the, the illnesses are going to come due to reversals of qi, right? So you need a, a, a system of medicine that's based in these things. So when they talk about um, Chinese medicine, they talk about either qi, the sinking, or becoming stagnant, or becoming too excessive, yin and yang, with yin balance. Those are the things you need to understand. Those are the things you need to diagnose. I think there's a great danger with people who are taking um, people into high-end qigong, microcosmic orbit work, opening channels to a high extent and things like that, who don't have knowledge of Chinese medicine. I think that's a, that's a slightly risky thing. We don't have enough people in the, qi, in the West doing qigong uh, at this kind of level to experience an epidemic of qigong sickness like they've had in China at different times. But um, I think it will increase more in the future. I think it will increase more. Uh, more and more people are practicing and more and more information is becoming available in the West. You know, the internet is, means you can find anything. I mean, you go on the internet, right? If I, if I type in a Qigong practice, I'll find 99 useless methodologies made up by someone. One of those, you're like, bloody hell, oh, that's an authentic, like, you know, inner door dragon gate exercise. How on earth did people get hold of that? And it's there on the internet. People can practice it. Some people will practice it quite safely um, and often will not get much result for it because they haven't done the foundation work, so it'll just get discarded along with most of the other stuff on the internet. Um, that one rare person will already be on the edge of their energy moving too much. They do that practice without safety protocols in place and boom, they start to get an illness uh, starting to come out. You get a sickness. And I've, the people I've treated, lots of them have had that as an issue, especially if they've gone to learn of a teacher who's learned things off the internet or something like that and doesn't understand what they're doing and, and yeah it can be a problem and they're difficult conditions to treat um, if you don't have a knowledge of how energy moves inside the body uh, which is why Chinese medicine should be a vital and integral part of um, Qigong practitioners and Qigong, no, Qigong teachers training if they ever want to go past the foundations I mean foundations is fine um, I would also say if you are just a Qigong teacher doing the foundations um, and you don't know Chinese medicine, then find some Chinese medicine practitioners in your area and uh, you know, work with them, go to see them, speak to them, get treatments off them, get a five or six in your area, figure out which ones are good, because um, not everyone's good, some of them are shitter. See what it, figure out which one's good, pair up with them, and, and so you've got some backup. So if you've got someone who comes in um, who has something wrong, maybe they were wrong before they come in your class, like um, then you don't have to be the one that screwed them up. But, if they come in, you've got somewhere to send them to, to get them some uh, help, you know, because this can happen too. Um, if everybody who comes into your class is getting sick, though, like, maybe consider stopping teaching, like, uh, <laughs> you're doing something wrong. Um, so, can I combine Qigong or Tai Chi Chuan with other arts? Um, all right, well, I sort of answered this a little bit when I looked at uh, weightlifting um, with you, in that uh, if you build the body in two different ways, that can be a little bit uh, contradictory. You know, you can't contract everything and hope everything to open. So that on a practical level, you, you need to be careful what you combine them with um, if you want to uh, develop as far as you can. I mean, you need, every art needs a certain body. A weightlifter needs a certain body. A football player needs a certain body. A ballet dancer needs a certain body. And Tai Chi needs a certain body. Qigong needs a certain body. I mean, it's the same with everything. You know, you wouldn't... You don't get many professional athletes that have the build of a, without being, I don't know, I was just trying to say something, without a, a darts player. All right, you look at a, it was in that darts, they call them athletes, and generally they look like they could keel over from a coronary any second when they come on your TV screen, but you wouldn't expect the darts player's body to be applicable to, uh, you know, 
football or something like that. There's a, there's a very different build, okay? The football player needs certain qualities in their body to be able to perform their uh, practice properly, you know, and uh, that would be different from what a boxer needs or, or whatever. And Qigong is the same. Like, people don't realize your body needs building. So can you combine arts with Tai Chi and Qigong? Yes, but you need to understand if the body is clashing with another body. Um, and if you don't, if you're aware of that and you don't mind, then that's fine. And maybe life is a wonderful thing with infinite possibilities of what you can study, which is what makes it interesting. You know, I never understand how anyone's bored with all these different things you can possibly do. Uh, so, if you're interested in just studying lots of different things, then of course go ahead and, and study them. But if you really want to get the bottom of an art like Qigong or Tai Chi Chuan, then you should make sure you don't. Um, slow down your progress or halt it by studying something that directly clashes with Tai Chi or Chiang. You know, all the time with martial arts, um, say with uh, Tai Chi, people would do Tai Chi and then they'll try to do a, a very physical martial art based on uh, contraction or closing the body up or, or something and they never really get to the bottom of either of these arts um, because the body is trying to be built in uh, two different directions. You, so. I would say you can combine arts with Tai Chi, but you need to understand what each one is doing to your body and what each one is doing to your mind. I should also say you don't need to. You know, people um, sometimes study another art because they think there's something missing from their own. I would say you probably just haven't gone deep enough into your own art. You know, I mean, I, I combine Tai Chi with other things. Um, I combine it with Qigong, meditation, Chinese medicine, uh, Bagua. I mean, they're, they're complementary arts from within system, one system. What I don't combine Tai Chi with is, uh, you know, a lot of contractive bodybuilding or anything like that. And um, that's not, yeah, that wouldn't be a way, wouldn't be a key to success.